Well, good morning, Greenwich, and welcome to the Thursday, September 29th edition of the Basement Academy. I think today's study and reflection will be important. I think I'm going to struggle to say what I want to say well, and so uh, even as you begin uh, to listen, uh, it, it'll already be recorded by the time you're watching or listening to this, but uh, prayers that what I say will be heard well that will be faithful and honoring to God and to those who bear his image uh, in all places uh, uh, and of all skin colors. But I, I want to begin with a morning psalm that, that has some language. Fierce men conspire against me for no offense or sin of mine. And, and sadly, this is a reality in our world, that, that people are attacked for nothing they've done simply by virtue of their skin color. And so this is in the context of David's life when Saul had sent men to watch David's house in order to kill him. That's what uh, the heading says on Psalm, 40, uh, Psalm 59 here. And so Psalm 59. Deliver me from my enemies, O God. Protect me from those who rise up against me. Deliver me from evildoers and save me from bloodthirsty men. See how they lie in wait for me. Fierce men conspire against me for no offense or sin of mine, O Lord. I have done no wrong, yet they are ready to attack me. Arise to help me. Look on my plight. O Lord God Almighty, the God of Israel, rouse yourself to punish all the nations. Show no mercy to wicked traitors. They return at evening, snarling like dogs and prowl about the city. See what they spew from their mouths. They spew out swords from their lips and they say, who can hear us? But you, O Lord, laugh at them. You scoff at all those nations. O my strength, I watch for you. You, O God, are my fortress, my loving God. God will go before me and will let me gloat over those who slander me. But do not kill them, O Lord, our shield, or my people will forget. In your might, make them wander about. Bring them down for the sins of their mouths, for the words of their lips. Let them be caught in their pride. For the curses and lies they utter, consume them in wrath. Consume them till they are no more. Then it will be known to the ends of the earth that God rules over Jacob. They return at evening snarling like dogs and prowl about the city. They wander about for food and howl if not satisfied. But I will sing of your strength. In the morning I will sing of your love, for you are my fortress, my refuge in times of trouble. O oh, my strength, I sing praise to you. You, O oh God, are my fortress, my loving God. Mm. A bit of a long psalm, but boy, very rich. And the images of snarling like dogs and prowling about the city, kind of the way David was being hunted. Wow. This language about men conspiring against him, us, for no offense or sin, only for the color of, of skin. And so um, it, it goes both ways, right? <laughs> People of color have been attacked for no sin or offense. And, and, and now it seems as if there is a, a, a kind of a quiet working back simply for the color of my skin. I am accused of things that for no offense or sin of mine, there's kind of a, a verbal attack. No, no violence, but, but nonetheless. So, so we've talked about identity, these last uh, kind of first two issues, particular areas of misalignment or tension that I have or we have as leadership at Greenwich with our denomination. And so today we want to talk about race and racism. And, and it's, it is lamentable, right? One of the things I appreciate about our denomination is its willingness to engage the issues of the day, poverty, injustice, uh, gun violence, racism, how to care for and extend compassion to the gender nonconforming, those who identify not as male or female and the like. Um, and, and so there's, there's much to be commended in our denomination, a, a sensitivity and a concern for the, the suffering of the human family. And, and, and the suffering because of racial violence and racism uh, has, has been great. We lament this, uh, the, the violence, the loss of life, the harm that is done to people of color over the years and currently. 
and for those who advocate and stand with them who may not share uh, the skin color, but share a compassionate concern. And so advocates um, uh, around these issues, allies uh, often suffer as well. <clears throat> the, the, the disagreement that I find with the Presbyterian Church is not over the issue of whether or not racism is real and it's an issue. Of course it is. The, 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 where, where I find fault and where I get off the bus and where, where I, where I uh, am, am at odds is with regard to the root cause or, or the solution. I lament the lack of theological depth and framework that is wrapped around this. I, the, the, the language I'm hearing, I'm holding up my allyship training, 18 hours and, and no theological reference other than image of God. There, there was no, no other theological framework offered other than uh, the image uh, of God. Racism is a blight on the human family, but we understand this theologically. It is an intractable, unsolvable issue. No amount of legislation, no amount of money, no amount of funding, no amount of political reform and advocacy will eradicate racism because it is a deeply embedded reality known as sin. And it traces back to the fall. It is the deepest form of tribalism. So how many times have we gone through Genesis 3, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, taken unto themselves the autonomous right and authority to define good and evil for myself. So we become autonomous centers. We become godlike in that way. And then we form these moral tribes. And one of the deepest, most primal, uh, earliest uh, 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 tribe, uh, tribal formations is over skin color. You look different than me. I'm going to attack you. I'm going to demonize you. It is a theological argument we must make against racism. Not a, sadly, <laughs> The, the argument that is made is framed not on the theology. I went through 18 hours and it was not a theological framing. It was a Marxist framing. And I'm saying that not to, not to cherry pick or anything. It's just a reality. If you if, go back to the, the critical race theory, the critical theorists based their understanding on the Marxist philosophy of oppressors and oppressed, access to power and denial of power. Marxism in its purest form is economic. Neo-Marxism broadens that out to other ways. But it's about power, access to power, denying access to power, systems and structures that preserve and protect power. There's something to learn there, but that is not the best framework around it. We need a theological framework. And so my frustration, my disappointment, and again, where I believe the boundary lines have shifted uh, uh, for our denomination is that now we make <clears throat> arguments not based on these scriptures that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, that racism is a universal human phenomenon. Now it is seen as a particular phenomenon of those who bear white skin or lighter colored skin, and particularly those who are white male. And so the allyship training and the Presbyterian way of framing things now is back to these identity issues. That's why I started there. And so the Presbyterian Church lifts up as primary one's racial identity, one's gender, and again, not even the binary of male or female, and one's class. So straight, white, Christian, male, you know, upper class, etc., are the problem. No, we start with the image of God and we start with our identity in Christ. And so, so I, I, I find fault there. And I lament the lack of uh, this theological framework and depth. And I've raised this to our uh, presbytery leadership as recently as last week, uh, having conversation with our general presbyter. And I said that the training, as good as it was, was lacking because we didn't wed it with, with good theology. Um, a, a second way of seeing where um, our, our, the Presbyterian understanding of racism is, is deficient Again, not that racism is an issue, but this deficient understanding and then how to a a address this. When, when we hear of systems and structures of racism and trying to dismantle um, uh, structural and systemic racism, we're using language that, that is unknown to, to the scriptures. Better language would be the world. Jesus spoke about the world. Paul wrote about the world. John wrote about the world. Our scriptures speak to us 
keep yourself from the world. Do not love the things in the world. And, and we've talked about this before in our Sermon on the Mount study around mammon. You see, Jesus said, you cannot serve God and mammon. It's not God or the devil. It's mammon. Mammon is more than just money. It's all that money represents. Mammon represents that organizing principle of the world. The world is that uh, system that humanity um, comes up with. It's a way of defying God. We, we do develop systems. We do develop structures. Uh, so I, I'm all in for systemic and structural realities, but we must understand them properly. It, these are deeply embedded realities that come about because of sin, because the world is in rebellion against God. And so, so when we understand that the world represents the organizing principle of a defiant humanity who has rejected God, rejected the truth, rejected the scripture, and rejected the Christ, that, that frames things differently. So, so it starts to shape the way we address racism. So if you're just thinking it's about power and access to power, you're going to try to legislate. You're going to try to get power. You're going to try to win elections so that I can have power to overcome your power and put you in the place of the powerless. That's not the solution uh, to, to racism. You see, I believe a lot of people think that the purpose of the church is to change society no. The church is not to change society. The church is to be an alternative society, to be the new society that God is bringing about. It's the beachhead. <laughs> A beachhead is formed. And so as Jesus comes and gathers 12 and then gathers crowds and then 3,000 and then go, the church is God's new society. It is the redeemed, renewed humanity that is gathered not because of skin color or, or tribe, or race, or gender, or class, because in Christ there is no Jew, nor Greek. There is no slave, nor free. There is no male, nor female. The world organizes itself according to race, class, and gender. The world uh, uh, bunches together and, and forms these racial tribes, and uh, economic tribes, and, and, and gender tribes, and the like. Not so with you, the Christian. Jesus comes to break down the dividing wall of hostility between Jew and Gentile, the, the, the primary racial divide, as it were. And so we join across racial lines in unity with Jesus Christ. So the church isn't to change society. The church is to be the new society. And so here's an example of that. I have seen in the last couple of years a number of advertisements from our presbytery as well as our larger denomination training for pastors to become community organizers. Now, the language of community organizing was popularized by a guy named Saul Alinsky. He's not the only one, but it is a popular way of thinking. Community organizing is taking people and forming a power block and, and exercising power through marches and protests and boycotts. And so you use whatever means necessary to bring power against power. So what's the language of the community organizers? Speak truth to power. That is not biblical language. The way of Jesus Christ is not a power game. The powerful became powerless, right? Jesus gave his life. And so enduring suffering is the way that the world has changed, not by exercising power. So I've seen these and I've laughed, but I've lamented. Oh, I need to become a community organizer. That's the way of our denomination. That's the way to address racism. And so when you read these uh, General Assembly documents and you read our allyship training documents, it's all the language of community organizing. It's all the language of neo-Marxism and critical theory. And absent is the theology. Oh, there's some theology that's, that's tacked. There's some Bible verses that are tacked onto it, but, but it's really not there. And so... Um, I say these things not because I'm angry and I recognize it's tricky in saying what I'm saying, but here, oh yeah, here's a white guy objecting to 
the training uh, uh, in our denomination around anti-racism. Sure, there's a white guy with his white privilege showing his white fragility again. And I'll just stand in that place of accusation if that's the way I'm thought of by you or by others. No, I'm a pastor, teacher, who has a call, regardless of any of this racial stuff, to know the word, to know it well, to teach it well, to be faithful, because it is through the word that God is transforming the world. It is through the word that he transforms the human heart. It's through the word that he forms a new community. It's through the word that, that, that men and women, boys and girls of every race and tribe and nation and people find unity at a table. We've all been washed in the same waters. We all eat and sup at the same table and we all proclaim the same Lord. And that's the only hope for this society and this world. <laughs> and so... Back to the very beginning of our study 20 some odd times ago, 20 some episodes ago, this is a discipleship opportunity. When issues of race come up, we speak into it a theological world a word. And so the, the, the answer is not a political, it's not a legislative, it's not a reform movement. The answer is a theological movement. When issues of race come, we say, yes, we affirm fully that all men and women, boys and girls, wherever they're found, whatever skin, color, and language, they are made in the image of a glorious God and they have dignity and value. But all have fallen and so God has sent his son Jesus to gather to himself from every race, tribe, language, nation. And the answer to racism is to come into the church and learn to honor one another and to submit to one another and to love one another as Christ has loved us. Well, what about society and race? I said, I lament that. Let us be kind, let us be gracious, but let us invite people into another society where these things do not happen. I say, but the church is racist. Absolutely, there is a racist history in the American church, and there's a racist history, I'm sure, in all kinds of churches, which says that the church needs to be perfected. There is no solution outside of Jesus Christ. So the discipleship opportunity here is a gospel opportunity for us to examine our own hearts, where I may look at those uh, who bear the image of God and if I look down on them because of their skin color or because of their language or their custom or their dress, then mine is the call to repent. But I repent and re reunite with Jesus Christ. And I try to welcome these as sisters and brothers. Come, know Jesus and let us eat together at the same table. Let us be joined. And so I would wish for our Presbyterian church to preach this message. <laughs> to preach this message and to give as much energy and funding and attention to this message as it does to the alternative message, uh, sadly, that it, that it is putting out. So. so this is the issue here. I've got this one other point down here where it says political advocacy. I might talk a little bit about that more tomorrow, but um, we see uh, announcements from the Office of Public Witness urging us, urging me as a pastor and we as elders to call our congregation, i.e., I would be asked to call Greenwich to contact your senator to support some particular legislative agenda. Let me assure you, I'm never going to do that. I'm never going to tell you to call your, I may tell you to vote. <laughs> I ain't going to tell you how to vote. I'm not going to call you, you know, ask you to contact your senator and support some legislative agenda. Maybe the closest thing might be if it's about religious freedom. But I'm certainly not going to tell you some partisan agenda because I'm not convinced necessarily that what I'm being asked to advocate for is even possible. So another area of frustration I have with the Presbyterian Church is its... Um, advocacy for political advocacy uh, as a solution. And I, I'm sad about that. So let me close here. Uh, hopefully I've given you a few things to think about. <laughs> and I invite your prayers for me um, that I might repent of anything I've said that is harmful, that is unhelpful, uh, that does not draw you closer to Jesus or closer to others, uh, your neighbors whom you are called to love. So let's pray. Father, thank you for the joy that we find in the gospel, though our hearts ache at the brokenness of our world, help us to see this brokenness, particularly around race, as an opportunity to lift up a new vision for a new humanity 
grounded and centered in Jesus Christ and in Christ alone, not skin color, not race, not class, not gender, in Christ alone. So Lord, help us to do that at Greenwich and in our own conversations and families and homes and places of work. Lord, help us to do this for your glory and forgive me for anything I've said that is unhelpful, that does not build up your church, that does not bring honor to your name, that in in some way does not lead us uh, to love our neighbor uh, more deeply. Lord, hear our prayer as we make it in your holy name, even as Jesus taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. May God be gracious to you. May God bless you. May God keep you this day and forevermore. Amen.